Hey everyone. Welcome to the Groundwork Podcast. I am your host, Kate Cavanaugh, and I am, as always, so excited to bring you our guest this week. When I started this podcast, I had this mission to unearth these interconnected themes of mind, body, and soil. I have this felt sense that there's this greater puzzle out there that I am trying to solve, and my curiosity is leading me towards these guests, each one of which I feel holds a handful of pieces to this greater puzzle. There's a gentleman who's written several beautiful books, and his name is Charles Eisenstein, and he think, he speaks about the myth of separation, whether that's the separation to nature, that we view ourselves as separate from nature when really we are a part of it, or our separation from each other when really we exist as an interconnected whole and collective. I'm really driven to find how all of these things connect, how we can see the macrocosm within the microcosm and vice versa. And my experiences with farming and with regenerative agriculture and with my own health journey has really shown me this glimpse of how deeply interconnected we really are. And I think my guest today holds a really big key when we're trying to understand that interconnectedness. Before I get into that, I want to share a little piece out of this book I'm reading actually for a future guest. It's a textbook called Systems View of Life by Fridjof Capra and Pierre Luigi Luisi. And I just thought this really summed it up. So when we're talking about this idea of separation, we really have been for most of human history deeply connected to nature and its rhythms. We evolved hunting, gathering, seeing the sun, being connected to the earth. And it's really only been in the last couple hundred years and to some extent since the dawn of agriculture 10,000 years ago that we've begun to sort of break from nature. But the Systems View of Life book brought up a really interesting point that Rene Descartes was really at the impetus of sort of this, this reductionist view and, and this deep break that we had from nature. Descartes based his whole view of nature on this fundamental division between two independent and separate realms, mind and matter. And anybody who's familiar with his work will, will kind of understand this. And I'm going to pull this quote from Systems View of Life. The Cartesian division between mind and matter has had a profound effect on Western thought. It has taught us to be aware of ourselves as isolated egos existing inside our bodies. It has led us to set a higher value on mental than manual work. It has enabled huge industries to sell products, especially to women, that would make us owners of the ideal body. It has kept doctors from seriously considering the psychological dimensions of illness and psychotherapists from dealing with their patients' bodies. In the life sciences, the Cartesian division has led to endless confusion about the relation between mind and body, which has begun to be clarified only very recently by decisive advances in cognitive science. In physics, it has made it extremely difficult for the founders of quantum theory to interpret their observations of atomic phenomena. According to Werner Heisenberg, who struggled with the problem for many years, this partition has penetrated deeply into the human mind during the three centuries following Descartes, and it will take a long time for it to be replaced by a different attitude toward the problem of reality. And as we go into today's podcast, I think that this quote is really important because I truly believe that there is a paradigm shift afoot that we are beginning to overcome this Cartesian division between mind and matter to really explore the interconnections of human health, ecology, physics, and just our great interconnected 
place on this planet. And I think we see this reflected again in the macrocosm. When I look at the ecosystem and the mycelial networks and networks of bacteria that are having these elegant conversations between organisms across a forest, I know that we are no different than that system. And so while some of the ideas in this podcast may be new to you, I want you to enter them with a really open mind and a sense of curiosity about just how interconnected we may be within our own bodies at a cellular level, with our environment, with nature, in this space of governing our biology, and out and to with each other. I do want to tell a really short little story about how some of my curiosity about some of these topics that we're going to discuss today came up. But first, let me tell you, so Carrie Bennett, who is my guest today, is absolutely incredible. She is a powerhouse and compendium of incredible knowledge about our bodies and our environment. And she just radiates energy and light. When we speak with Carrie, we're exploring the depths of circadian biology, exclusion zone water, EMFs, the quantum model of human biology, grounding in electrons, artificial light in our environment and how it's affecting us. I like to call this junk light. And really quick at the beginning of this podcast, what I wanted to do was to share the story that led me into being curious about this work and some of the quick and easy practices that I have to help me better connect to these things that we don't discuss in the podcast. And so whether you want to come back to this after you listen, or you just want this really quick primer, either way. So first, this story. Some number of years ago, my husband went out of town and our Wi-Fi router sat behind the wall of our bedroom, right behind my head. And when he went out of town, I moved to his spot in the bed and I slept better. I thought this was really curious. And I reached out to my husband and I was like, oh my gosh, since you have gone out of town, I'm sleeping better. And I had this whole indictment. It must be something to do with him. And so I don't know what we're going to do, but sleep is so important to me. And when he came back, I decided that I wanted to stay on his side of the bed. And so he took my side of the bed and he began sleeping rather poorly. And I was thinking about all the different variables that might be influencing this when I thought to turn off the Wi-Fi router at night. Lo and behold, we both slept incredibly. And ever since then, with this this in of one anecdotal evidence, I've been really curious about our relationship as humans to being an electrical being. We are electrical beings and we are having interactions constantly with different electrical things and their electromagnetic fields. And we're going to really dive into this in the podcast, but I wanted to share with you that I had this experience and that is what has led me down the road that I am currently on. One of the things I really want to note is how many of the practices that Carrie discusses in the podcast are actually free. So they require no money. You can get sun in your eyes first thing in the morning. And again, please be aware, we're not saying to look at the sun, use your common sense here, but to get light in your eyes first thing in the morning, preferably at sunrise or within 15 minutes of waking, this is free. To put your feet on the ground and to gather electrons from the earth is free. And we talk about some things about mitigating your exposure to EMFs or to your Wi-Fi router. One of my biggest tricks for this is to actually just put your Wi-Fi router on an analog timer that you would use for Christmas lights. And I'll link to this in the show notes. You can get them for $8. It's super easy. And you can just begin to see if you sleep better at night when you remove this variable. 
The other thing I highly recommend is that you deeply consider switching your LED light bulbs, which are filled not just with blue light, but also with flicker, which is going to be this rate of the light sort of vibrating. And it's usually sub-perceptual, but you can find this if you use your phone camera to film them on slow motion that actually agitates our nervous system. And we really see this flicker really only occurs in nature if we are running through the forest in all of this dappled light. And I, I, we've really worked to change our light environment within our home, oftentimes using candles or amber burning Edison bulbs, or you can even get LEDs that are specific temperatures and don't have any blue light and have been tested for flicker if you're if you're really passionate about energy saving bulbs and this has made a really big difference in our light environment and is a fairly low cost way of doing it just slowly transitioning out all of your light bulbs and then one step up from that is getting blue light blocking glasses Uh, I think especially for those of us that work often on computers. I'm on a computer right now. I have blue light blockers for the daytime and I also have a set of blue light blockers for nighttime that really sets me up to maintain the melatonin in my brain. You're going to learn so much more from Carrie. And so all of these are just little pieces that you can begin to put together to create a better connection to your health and to begin to shift your environment to explore that relationship between your health and your environment. And then we are given this beautiful gift of nature, which is free. And you'll hear Carrie and I talk about this in the episode. And when we say nature, we're not saying like drive three hours to a forest, but just go outside and stand on a patch of grass can be that simple. And so So many of these practices are free, which I think is really exciting. And so much of it really begins to change your health. And Carrie exemplifies this. She is one of the biggest wealth of knowledge that I have ever interviewed on this podcast. And I was just floored at her. And so if you, like me... You want to learn more from Carrie. She has a beautiful course called Connect to the Light, and you can get 15% off using the coupon code KATE, K-A-T-E, 15. And again, that will be in our show notes. I can't wait for you to hear this episode. If this episode helped you connect the themes of mind, body, and soil, will you do me a huge favor and share it with any family or friends that you think might also benefit from the incredible wisdom Carrie has to provide in this episode? I also run a special where if you leave a review on Apple Podcasts and send me a little snapshot of the review on Instagram or at kate at groundworkcollective.com, I send you a handwritten note in return. And this is part of my big effort to connect with you, my listeners, in the physical. And I, I mean an honest review. It can be good. It can be bad. I just want this chance to receive feedback and then to connect with you in turn. And so I appreciate all of your sharing of the episode and all of your beautiful reviews. And without further ado, the incredible Carrie Bennett. So I'm just so, I'm so excited to have you here. I just think that your work is so crucial. And I was thinking the other day that a big part of this podcast is my exploration of, I have this felt sense that there's a greater puzzle out there and I'm just seeking people that have these pieces of this puzzle that I'm, I'm sort of looking to uncover. And I think that you have so many pieces of this puzzle and this integration into, into returning us to harmony and to feeling a part of nature. And so I'm excited to have you on. I, I want to start this off with you introducing yourself. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me. That was a, a lovely little introduction. And I, I've been kind I'm grateful that I've been able to 
start to gather these puzzle pieces in a public way. Like it's like it's like I'm, we're learning together, right? I learned something and I share it. I'm so excited to go into that today. So, um, well, let me uh, me right. Who am I? <laughs> I'm well. First and foremost, I am a mom of three, right? So I'm a. I've got a lovely husband, Leon, and I've got three little kids, uh, ten, five, and two. And so that's a huge part of my life, right? So it's this this kind of journey has not just been about what benefits me because I have had some health challenges, but it's what benefits my family. Um, the world is changing fast and I yes, kind of want to stay, I want to stay on top of it, right? I want to know what I can do to best support the health of my family. And so this whole my whole dive into science, biological sciences, I, I fell in love in high school. I don't even know why. I think I just did, right? It just something clicked. Me too. Um, can, right? You know, I mean, it was like a cool subject. You know, I, the chemistry, okay. Physics, okay. Biology. I think I had some really great biology teachers. So shout out to Mr. Eshelman, Mr. Malash. Um, and I, the college, it was the thing. I went to a really, really good science program at a small liberal arts college. Um, and so, and, and same thing, great professors there. I learned so much. And at the end of my time there, I had some options, you know, I had the option to go into some PhD programs, some MD programs. I actually also did a concentration that would have allowed me to teach secondary education, biology classes. Uh, you know, so I did some student teaching <laughs> And in the grand scheme, at the very end of it, I went, I was a volleyball player there too. I went into my coach's office when school was almost over and I broke down crying. And I said, I don't want to do any of those things. None of that feels right. I love biology. I love sciences, but that just doesn't seem like the direction that I'm being called in. And so, you know, she was, she's, she's so supportive. She's like, well, trust your gut, you know, listen to your gut. What does your gut tell you to do? And I was like, well, my gut tells me that I want to go to massage therapy school. <laughs> I love that. And um, and so like, you know, she's like, make it happen. Like, make it work, make it happen. So I told my parents, it was like, you know, and they they blessed me with a college education. And so and I, and so the conversation was kind of like, um, you know, I love it. I loved everything about it, but now I want to go to massage therapy school. And their reaction was very cool, right? They basically were like, We support you, get a job and do it, right? It's like fair, totally fair. So uh so I took my background in all of the athletic stuff that I did my whole life from high school and college. And I became a personal trainer. I went through massage therapy school and I opened in Kalamazoo, Michigan, the very first tiny little personal training studio that I also had a side room for massage therapy. And I just started doing that, you know, and it was great because wow. I learned so much from the biological sciences in college. And then I had this whole different view of the body through massage therapy school. We, we moved energy. We, we held acupressure points, right? We did polarity and cranial sacral therapy and all of these, like this energy work that I was never taught about. And it made sense, right? It was like, okay, there's a different way that I could do the body. And so, you know, I'm going through life, personal training, massage therapy, kind of bouncing back, bouncing back. And then I have my first child. And he had some health challenges of his own, you know, um, and I, after I gave birth, started to develop horrific digestion, stomach pains because mm -hmm. he was not a great sleeper. It was, there was insomnia, right? I'm up at three o'clock in the morning on my cell phone going, why is my child a bad sleeper? Meanwhile, I've got his baby camera, like literally positioned right next to his face in the crib. Cause I'm freaked out as a new mom. Right. And I've got night lights everywhere in his bedroom because I'm freaked out as a new mom. And this just exacerbates like this. Everything gets worse. I get this joint pain that I had a little bit of in college. It just starts to get really bad. And so like any good nerd, right. You know, I've <laughs> Got my master's degree in mm -hmm. nutrition because I thought that was the foundation. It's like, oh, I'm missing something with the fitness and the massage. I got to get, I got to learn more. So yeah. I went to a chiropractic college for, uh, to get a master's degree in applied clinical nutrition. And that made some impacts, right? I started to view the body with that lens as well. And I was doing okay, you know, but it not, I didn't feel great. You know, I kind of just thought like, oh, you know, everyone told me when you have a kid, you're not going to feel the same. And then when you hit 40, you're not going to feel the same. Like just, ju oh, just wait until you're at that age that you're going to feel. And I was, I was starting to feel older. You know, it's like what's puffy, old, tired. It's like, this isn't fun. There's got to be something else to it. And I don't know how I stumbled upon a blog by Dr. Jack Cruz, but I did, right? And 
there was this fascination. It was a combination of his almost in his intelligence and arrogance and kind of like, I'm not going to dumb this down for you. I love that about him out. Right. Yes. And so I, 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 can I, I don't want to necessarily swear on this show, but I was basically you can. like, F, okay, I was like, fuck you. I am going to figure this out, right? And so yeah. there goes my journey of like quantum biology. I dove into not just his blogs, but you know, his in his blogs, he alludes to so many different researchers. And I was just like, oh, I'm going to read that woman's book. And and that guy, I'm going to listen to that guy's podcast and, and dive into her research. And, and I became so infatuated with it, not because it just stimulated my brain in a different way, but I started applying it. And it was like, whoa, now I'm finally waking up with energy. Now me and my kids are finally going to sleep at a normal time and they're sleeping well. You know, it's just so many things clicked into place when I finally implemented circadian biology and quantum biology. And I don't know, ever since then, I've kind of just continued to dive into it. And and I just like sharing what I'm learning with with us, with whoever's willing to listen. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. And I love these journeys that start as sort of an experiment of N of one, where you're mm-hmm. just on a journey to, to look at your health differently and the health of your family. And it leads you down all of these many rabbit holes. And I think we actually share some similarities. I spent seven years in college working on a biology and physical anthropology degree and then left to go be a butcher, which felt about as, as relevant (laughs) Yeah, yeah. and learned a lot about bodies through that lens of getting to be inside of tissue and fascia and muscles and getting to see the scope of an animal's life sort of from the inside out, looking backwards as I saw all the impacts of their life in their tissues. Right. Amazing. Um, And so I actually, and this is a little bit funny, I'm so excited to dive into all the quantum biology, but I actually want to start with this question around collagen. And I think (laughs) as, as a butcher, and I've seen how foundational, I've seen the macro makeup of collagen throughout a body in terms of connective tissue and fascia and ligaments. And that says nothing for the microscopic level that collagen is appearing. And so I I feel like there's this piece of this collagen that is really foundational to your work and understanding all the ways that electricity and light and communication is unfurling inside of our bodies. And so I just wanted to start here. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about collagen. Absolutely. You know, um, it wasn't a piece of the puzzle that I was actually ever thinking I would look into when I got into quantum health. Um, But it's the, it's the piece that really connects the dots, if you will, all throughout the human body. And so what, what I love about fascia is that it's everywhere, but the problem with Western science, and as you probably know, based on your dissections and stuff or your butchering, right? Same thing. It's, it's called different things in different locations. Mm-hmm. Like you said, when, when, when it connects a bone to a bone, it's a ligament. When it connects a bone to a muscle, it's a tendon, right? And so we've, we've reduced it into different things, right? Different, different structures, if you will, based on its location. But what we now know about the connective tissue, it's literally a web that goes everywhere from the macroscopic, right? Like the band of connective tissue that we can feel in our iliotibial tract or maybe in our back, you know, the columbar fascia, um, all the way then deep into the cell. It crosses the cell membrane via these proteins called integrins. So, you know, it goes from this fascia to the extracellular matrix around the cell into the cell through these proteins inside of the cell it's the cytoskeleton goes through the 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 nuclear membrane right into the nucleus where it is the nuclear matrix and it actually attaches everything all the way down to the dna so when i realized this it was a oh gosh i've been looking at the wrong systems for a long time in terms of what do i need to do to optimize human health it's my nervous system matters. It does. My cardiovascular system matters. It does. But when we're talking about being able to tap into a system, an organ that literally connects everything, everywhere, the fascia, the connective tissue had to be it for me. And so that's when I went into the rabbit hole. And the researcher who I think has done a brilliant job at really sharing fascia and, and, its, and, and, and its connectivity is James Oshman, Dr. Jim Oshman. 
who actually wrote the co-wrote the book Earthing, right? So he's he's kind of in that 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 realm, and he also wrote an energy medicine book. So it, it's very fascinating. He's kind of anchored in this this realm of of you know uh, physical anatomy science, you know, with energy, and uh, he termed it the living matrix, and I love it. It is mm, a living matrix. That's beautiful. And then, and then when I discovered that it was that 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 this collagen, that this fascia that goes everywhere, is surrounded by water. And that that water is important in this whole quantum talk. Uh, and that's that's where, you know, I'm in love, basically. <laughs> I could talk about that all day. <laughs> yeah. And I think that there's this beautiful, I mean, just this beautiful interconnectivity that's happening within our bodies that is then able to translate what's coming in from our environment and to sort of begin to have that conversation at a quantum biological level. And I wanted to... I, first, and this is this is on a really personal note, as I've been I've been reading this textbook called Systems of Life by Frijo mm. Capra, oh. um, who also wrote the Tao of Physics and mm. is just a really fascinating gentleman. And it's sort of looking cool. at ecology through the quantum model. And through that, I've been thinking a lot about when we broke into this linear methodology of thinking that around the time of Rene Descartes and Newton and yeah. Cartesian mathematics and this sort of initial foray into physics, there's this idea that everything is linear. We take a really mechanistic view. It's very reductionist. We're looking at these disparate parts instead of the interconnected parts of the whole. And I think that right now we're at this space in time where we're seeing this return to a nonlinear view and connecting back with the same lens that I think nature gives us to view these things, which is this holistic, interconnected, nonlinear, beautiful view. And so I'm just curious, really on a personal level, what you think is bringing us back around? Do you know, you you described it so beautifully, right? I think we're coming back. We're returning to what ancient civilizations knew and appreciated on such a profound level that I I'm embarrassingly say I didn't quite respect it to the level that I should, right? I should have. They knew about the interconnectedness of our bodies it, within itself, right? A non-reductionist approach to human physiology. The connection then to nature, the connection to fields of energy that permeate nature, permeate our bodies, right? And how and how to influence them in order to to uh, you know attain the ultimate health, right? And 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 maybe you would even say the ultimate bliss, salvation, whatever it might be. Yes. Um, and so and so I just feel like we're finally using the I'm using the quantum lens, the, the quantum language to appreciate something that's been known for thousands and thousands of years. And I feel like that resonates with people because unfortunately, even when I was in massage therapy school, learning about the meridians and stuff, I was like, oh, that's cool. But it's like I was I didn't that it wasn't valid enough for me. Like it's embarrassing mm -hmm. to admit that. Right. But now I finally feel this full circle of, oh, yeah, it made sense. It's cool. And I really am appreciating it because I have a different language for it. The language wasn't accessible to me before. And now it is. And I think by sharing that with people, people have these days we have an odd an odd infatuation with the word science right? Like, like yes. it's gotta be science. Yes. And, and um, I mean, it is scientism. Scientism. And, right. And it's become incredibly dogmatic. Dogmatic. And, and like these ideas, like science is truth. And it's like, science can't be further from the truth. Science is never proving yourself right. It's never proving truth. It's just connecting dots and kind of wiggling your way through what may be more likely to happen, what may be less likely. You know, it's never truth, but we're holding science as truth these days. And so I yes. think we need this quantum language that sounds really sophisticated, right? That sounds really, wow, we're talking about electrons and protons and photons and stuff. And like we're using this sciency language to describe ancient intelligence. And I think that's why it's becoming relevant th these days. And I think there was this in that ancient intelligence was a deep sense of knowing through just the natural interconnectivity that was happening within our environments. I mean, this was before we put 
four walls and a roof and all of these uh, gadgets in between us and nature and, and sort of this idea that we were separate from nature, which is a myth, uh, one that I, I really want to expose for what it is on this podcast. And so this is really, you know, getting into that quantum model of human biology and leaving what people might be more familiar with, with the sort of high school chemistry biochemical model of physiology and this sort of mechanistic little locks and keys. I'd love for you to talk about quantum biology from your view. And I know I wrote this down this morning from, from the Systems View of Life book that I'm reading, where he says, in quantum theory, we never end up with any things. We always deal with interconnections. This is how the new physic re physics reveals the oneness of the universe. And I loved Beautiful. that. That's but beautiful. I want to get your take on quantum biology and sort of lead us into this conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if you would have asked me that a year ago, I would have started inside of our bodies and would have talked about potentially that water that I alluded to earlier. But I think we have to take a big, a little broader approach than that, right? And this is that interconnectedness with nature. And we have to recognize, and as I'm learning, I'm, I'm asking questions about why I wasn't taught certain things, right? It's like, me too. You know, because in college, in high school, in grade school, probably, right? There's, there's three, you basically, you learn more about three states of matter. Oh, oh and oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, there's, there's solid, there's liquid, there's gas. And oh, yeah, there's this thing called plasma. That's all they say about plasma, right? Yeah, like, that it you exists. Don't, it exists, but you know nothing about plasma. And as I'm getting into quantum biology and quantum health, I, I realize, like you said, there's this interconnectedness because at that most uh, foundational level of energy in the universe, there is, uh, it, 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 it's like, I call it, it could be scalar energy. You know, I mean, it's, it's this foundational vibration, essentially, right? This fabric mm -hmm. of space that's vibrating, this minute, tiniest little vibrating vi vibration possible, right? The smallest, tiniest guitar strings that are like little plucked, but interconnected. And from that vibration coalesces greater and greater densities and greater and greater energies that ultimately manifest as this microphone that's in front, front of me, my body, this glass of water that's here, right? But essentially, we're all made from the same fabric. And yes. it's just that this fabric looks different. It's condensed differently. There's different atoms held together to hold that energy in certain configurations, but it's all the same. And so that's when I, that's where I really take a look at the body, right? It's like the, these different configurations of the same fabric. Um, and that, uh, you know, that gets us into so many different topics, right? Like then, uh, what are these energies? How do they layer upon us? How do we interact with them in our bodies? Uh, what parts of our bodies communicate with these energies, you know? And, and, and we, I mean, we can go from there. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that is really where I was thinking of going from there is how does our body create energy and what energies is it then interacting with in the environment? Yeah, absolutely. So let, let's start about, so in, in quantum health, I think the best way for people who are really starting to wanting to dive into this, I think the best way to, the best thing we can do is talk about the conventional paradigm of how we get energy and then how I think we really truly get energy, which is through that quantum health lens. I love this. Yeah. I always think it's good to sort of uncover that conventional idea before uncovering the sort of novel concept. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and and so I think conventionally we've all learned, right, that we get energy from food, right? We eat food, that food is our energy. Um, all food gets broken down into ultimately electrons, right, that go to our mitochondria. And we've all heard of the mito mitochondria, you know, eighth grade biology, something like that, the powerhouse of the cell, mm -hmm. right? It's driven into us that it's the powerhouse of the cell. Every lecture I teach, I always say, what is this <laughs> picture of? And someone says the powerhouse of the cell. So we all know that, right? Um, and so why is it called the powerhouse of the cell? Well, y it takes an electron and it kind of funnels that electron through various steps in something called the electron transport chain. And step five happens to make a substance called ATP. Um, and I feel like th that's kind of where we get to that reductionist I agree. Uh, hierarchical approach to is like, oh, 
the, the fifth step is ATP. So that must be the most important thing that gets made, right? The end product. Um, and so then all of a sudden there was these calculations and someone somewhere calculated that ATP has a high energy phosphate bond. And because ATP contributes to biochemical reactions and to proteins and stuff like this biochemistry mindset, the assumption was that ATP donates energy from one of its bonds, and that's the energy that's used to spark chemical reactions, right? Enzymatic reactions, chemical reactions, you name it. Um, and it was actually disproven a long time ago, uh, at least 50 years, I would say, by a researcher named Gilbert Ling, who has had the equivalent of a PhD in quantum mechanics, physics, mathematics, biology, chemistry, biochemistry, right? Like brilliant, brilliant human being. And he wrote all about it. He debunked it using math. He debunked it using biology, using chemistry, using physics. Fascinating. His work is insane. But because it is so high level, it never, no one ever took the time because you really had to access it from so many different like levels of expertise. Um, and, and, and plus some of his mentors, he, he originally used this to debunk the sodium potassium pump, which won the Nobel Prize, right, for why we have different charges oh. inside of the cell and outside of the cell. Like he debunked that. And his mentors said, uh, if we were you, we, we, we wouldn't go down that rabbit hole. Like leave that alone. Like let's just let that be. And he was just like, but it can't explain anything, right? We would literally need a thousand times more ATP than we're making just to work the sodium potassium pumps. ATP cannot be the main energy of the cell. And also, I don't think the sodium potassium pump is how we, you know, determine what goes in the cell and what goes out, the charges in and outside the cell. And so fast forward, right? Fast forward. We we said that we we've still it kept it because science is science doesn't like things that challenge it right if no. something won a nobel prize set in stone that's our truth right it's yes. truth it's never changing um and so that's why we still have this idea that atp is the energy currency of the cell we have to eat food to get the electrons that go to the mitochondria to make the atp and through my layers of kind of uncovering quantum biology i recognized like no that's not true at all I love this. And I love these moments in science. I talk about a lot about this from a meat standpoint, oftentimes, mm -hmm. where we get stuck in a certain dogma. So whether that figure is Ansel Keys getting stuck in a saturated fat dogma, this lens that we've worn for the last 50 years, and we become deeply embedded in it and sort of unable to see our way out. And I think true science is a process of evolving and adapting and exploring new information as it comes in, which I think it, it is at this time constantly coming in. Yeah, you're absolutely right, which is I think which is really why I um, was drawn to the work of Dr. Gerald Pollack, who kind of connected these dots with the energy, right? Because he um, he likes fringe science. You know, he, he his, one of the things, the best thing that he always says is new discoveries don't happen from the research in here. It happens from the fringe, but it takes us yes. as, as, as scientists and experts to not just automatically dismiss the fringe, but look into it. Right. But that's really where the new discoveries and that what, that's what advances science. It's not just replicating a bunch of studies that, that confirm your bias. Right. So um, and so his work, like for people who are unfamiliar, he's the one who really brought into prominence this this concept of the fourth phase of water, right? This idea that water actually inside of our bodies behaves completely different than any of the types of water that we can think of, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. And that right there, if we can understand the water network in our bodies, we can understand how we derive energy from nature. We can understand how we disseminate this energy everywhere because that water is in, in contact with the connective tissue, right? And we can understand then how to use parts of nature to charge up our energy, to charge up our battery. Um, and, and that puts food in its rightful place. It's a piece of the puzzle, but it's not by any means what big food wants us to think of as it's the only way that we can possibly derive any energy for our bodies. 
I love this. And so why don't you just dive right into the fourth phase of water and how that exists in our bodies and how that's creating energy? Yeah, absolutely. So so like I, like I alluded to, like when I was studying biology, I'm sure same thing with you, right? Like a, a cell, the pictures of a cell were like these water balloons, right? There was like this membrane on the outside and inside you saw like maybe five different things that could be in a cell, always a, a nucleus. There was always a mitochondrion. Um, maybe there was like the, the endoplasmic reticulum because it looks cool, like these little folds, right? You know, but then the rest of it was just like blue. And that blue implied that it was water. It was like this liquid water. And when we were taught that in a cell, there's this thing called random collision. Because there's this liquid water, molecules will randomly collide with each other, interact in a biochemical reaction, and that the product of that reaction will ultimately randomly collide with its next thing, and it'll cause some chemical reaction, and it'll... Ran and so this random collision... And I'm kind of mad at my younger self for not being like, that makes no sense. <laughs> you know? It was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's that's how it happens. Yeah, it's um, just all, it's it just makes, all random. It's all random, but... It, it makes no sense. When you understand that at the, 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 the cellular level, we have 100,000 tasks or reactions or things happening every cell every second, it can't possibly be by chance, right? It no. can't possibly be random. So something has to coordinate it or something has to hold things in the right proximity to each other so that they can react. And that's where this fourth phase of water comes in. It came in to start with. It was like, oh, so the cell is nothing like I think it is. The cell, the water in the cell, the water in our bodies is not this, right? It do, it's not a swirling liquid. You'll find liquid in the blood. You'll find some li liquid in the lymphatic system. But inside of our cells, around our cells, is a different phase of water. And it's called structured water, exclusion zone water, gel water, right? And that's what it is. It's actually been structured in a way that it retains a little bit of jiggle and wiggle, like a fluid, like a liquid. But it's real. the water molecules, the H's and O's, order and orient themselves into a structure that's a lot like a, what you would see if you looked at a crystal under an atomic microscope right you'd see these this this very ordered structure so it turns out that the wa the water there orders itself in these hexagonal like almost like honeycomb sheets and so the h's and the o's reconfigure themselves into into these honeycomb layers that interconnect and um, it changes the density of the water. It makes the water more of a gel. So think of like jello, like a jello jiggler, right? And because we have that water, it forms naturally, right? It forms spontaneously next to all biological surfaces. That means that everything inside and around my cells is structured into this water, this, this gel-like water. And so things can't just diffuse randomly. It, it, it's not possible because there's a difference between a protein moving through liquid versus something moving through a jello. And so that's where we, we started to recognize that things happen at the cellular level and in the body with vibration, with resonance. And that's where I had to really, you know, open my brain up to like what I also, but you know, that, that was even, even studying quantum health. I always thought vibration and resonance, that, well, that was kind of woo woo esoteric. I'm not going to go there. I'm going there because that has Good. to be how things, how things work. Right. And if everything is vibrating and everything is a frequency, then it makes sense that being able to hold things in a certain way so that frequencies can be shared is what provides an activation energy for reactions and downstream effects to happen. So that was what really shifted my, my concept of what the cell looks like and the inside of the cell and the function. But when I recognize that this water is everywhere, it's, it's everywhere and it structures itself when it, when it does structure itself into this, this, this hexagonal lattice, if you will, that hexagonal lattice has a negative charge. And it blew my mind because water, again, like we've been taught, this is neutral. Everyone's like, oh, this is a neutral. There's... And so when, when we look at charge, we look at the balance of electrons to protons, right? Something that has a negative charge with something that has a positive charge. And the balance in, of electrons to protons in liquid water, it balances itself out. It's neutral. So how is it that this structured water, this gel water could possibly have a negative charge? Well, when you look at how these uh, H's and O's in water reconfigure themselves into their hexagons, they can't have neutral charge, how they arrange themselves. They actually have to kick out an H in order to, to arrange themselves. So this type of water actually reconfigures its chemical formula. Instead of H2O, it's H3O2.
And when it kicks out a, a, a hydrogen, hydrogen is, is a very, very simple. It kicks out a hydrogen, and that hydrogen is essentially a proton, right? It's a positive charge because it just has a proton in the nucleus. And so all of a sudden, you have your biological surfaces, this negatively charged exclusion zone water, right? This fourth phase of water that, that kicks out a proton, and you get this buildup of protons in a proton zone right here. Negative next to a positive, Dr. Pollock's lab showed that that's potential energy that can light a light bulb, right? Microelectrodes lit up a light bulb. So all of a sudden, when you realize our body is full of biological surfaces, that all of these biological surfaces are covered in this exclusion zone water, that this exclusion zone water always forms a negative and a positive charge, and that that's a battery of energy, of potential energy, it makes so much more sense to me that that is how the body can drive a majority of its energy as opposed to consuming food, breaking it down into electrons and making ATP. And this, I think, explains, first of all, it gives this beautiful sense of order, this beautiful sense of connectivity. And I also think that this explains how we interconnect with our environment. And so can you talk a little bit more about how we maintain this exclusion zone water and how all of these processes interact with nature and with light and yeah. with the earth? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So like I said, it, it forms no matter what, but we were designed to continually what I call recharge this water battery, um, because if we're continually using up potential energy, there has to be a source that we're putting like an input, right, that we're putting back into it. And so the research in Pollock's lab showed that infrared light, specifically around 3000 nanometers, but there's a spectrum, right? Infrared light which is a wavelength of sunlight that's always present whenever the sun is out from dawn until dusk. Infrared light, as, as soon as we get it, we, we don't even have to let it touch our skin. We can just be outside, right? And the light wavelengths can penetrate our body up to 30 centimeters. And it provides, uh, it, it actually causes what we call an expansion of the exclusion zone. He showed that that exclusion zone can expand fourfold. So if we're expanding the negative charge, it means we're kicking out way more protons. And so we're basically quadrupling our battery capacity. Uh, and so uh, it makes sense that nature gave us a, 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 a huge source of energy simply using something that was there for a majority of the, well, all day, right? But a majority yes. of the 24 hour clock, the sun. Uh, and just because, and, and, and plants do, plants do this, but to, to a different extent, right? Plants go through photosynthesis where they also, the water captures a photon of sunlight and, but the water splits completely, right? You, you split an oxygen and you split a height, it splits completely. We don't split the water completely. We just kind of expand and shift and change the arrangement of it um, to create energy, right? So it's a, it's a very similar process, but just slightly differently adapted for humans or, and, and for a lot of living, living creatures for that matter. So it's really, really cool. If I can just go outside at any given time and quadruple my battery capacity, then why wouldn't I do that? How much easier is it for me to have drive energy from sunlight that way as opposed to, you know, before modern food convenience, before having to hunt some food, right? Like, and if I could gather something, it'd probably be pretty measly, right? Yes. And so it makes sense that I would be able to uh, derive energy in that way. Why would nature say, oh, it worked for plants, photosynthesis, right? It worked for plants for millennia, uh, millions of years, why not, like, it was, why, why would they say let's reinvent something completely different for humans? Um, and it mm. turns out that then also touching the bare earth, so earthing, right, grounding, another thing that I thought was woo-woo, uh, which isn't, right, we, we do conduct electrons from the surface of the earth into our bodies. So uh, earthing has been shown to also ex expand the exclusion zone, but earthing also is just an infinite source of gathering electrons into our bodies. And so not only does earthing charge our exclusion zone battery, but earthing also takes those electrons and can funnel those electrons into the mitochondria as well. So there's an alternative source of electrons for the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, which, by the way, step five, I said, makes ATP. Step four makes water right? Step four makes water. This is, this is where we said water is a byproduct. You know, everything, I bet you, you've taken enough biology and biochemistry classes, right? A oh, water is a byproduct of that reaction. Like ignore it basically. 
we make water in so many ways and it's not a byproduct. Water is what we need. And now we understand it through the lens of quantum biology and this exclusion zone battery of potential energy. And it makes so much sense that there's so many byproducts of water throughout all of our body. Everything that we do is a, makes a byproduct of water. And so, um, so there you go. Those electrons can expand the exclusion zone, but then they can go on to make more water in step four of the mitochondria. So we're just kind of reinforcing this cycle. We're making more intracellular water. Oh, step five also makes infrared, right? And ATP. Step five makes infrared. So the mitochondria are like our own little nature, right? Inside of us, because they can make the water and the infrared that also helps us structure it and expand our water battery. So it's wild, right? It is so wild. And I think it speaks to the incredible elegance that nature gives us. There, there are no waste products. Everything is being utilized. And I, I have a next question, but you just said something that really struck me that these mitochondria are really synthesizing all of this, but mitochondria actually existed outside of us initially. And so is there a link there with how mitochondria evolved to be a part of our cellular structure and what they're doing? Absolutely. Right. So mitochondria did, they used to be the endosymbiont theory goes that they used to be their own little bacteria that were free, their own little free bacteria. And, um, like billions of years ago, right? We're talking a long, long time ago. And that in that earth, that condition of earth, right? That aqueous condition of earth, the oxygen was less available, right? There were no plants yet. There were no, there were, there were no plants to be able to provide oxygen. So, so what happened was these mitochondria somehow were able to very effectively as bacteria extract oxygen from their environment, uh, their harsh environment and use that to make water and heat and all of these things that could reinforce the energy inside of them, right? As their own little independent creatures. Um, and so then all of a sudden the theory goes along came a bacteria, another bacterium that said, man, I'm like, I'm really bad at, at extracting oxygen, but I've got a really strong outer shell. These are harsh conditions in early earth. How about you hop in? I'll protect you. I'm not going to worry about energy production. You can make the ATP, the water, the, the infrared, and on we go. And so then cells evolved more and more complex life, complex organelles. And then you have us today, right? These very, very complex multicellular organisms. Um, but so, yeah, exactly. And because they existed outside of us at one point in time, not only do they retain the ability to make that water because they needed it themselves and the infrared, they're also very keen sensors of their environment. And so we, again, Newtonian reductionist approach, we've only considered mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell. But now we really know that they're like this central conductor, right? They're directing traffic. They can sense energy fields um, in various, in various really key ways, and they can respond their own energetics. And then they can signal from with biophotons and things like that to the DNA, to the lysosomes, you know, to, to, to the cell membrane, like they can do signaling. So they're the hub of the cell and it's because they can adjust the energy production and they can do a lot of signaling because they can sense everything that's happening inside of us and around us. And so they're sort of serving as this go between between us and our environment, which is really what's informing on governing all of our biology. And so when you talk about some of the frequencies, some of what they might be sensing outside of their, their cellular matrix, what might some of those things be? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great question. And it, these are layers that I'm still uncovering. But what I'm, what I'm seeing with this is that these mitochondria, um, because they're full of exclusion zone water, Exclusion zone water, so in the mitochondria themselves, and I'll talk a little bit about why I think the mitochondria are key, but all throughout the body, in uh, this exclusion zone water in physics would be termed a liquid crystalline substance, a liquid crystal. And it's what we ha what's why we had L why we have LCD displays, right? Liquid crystalline displays in, in televisions and things. Because liquid crystals have been studied for a long time for technology, but we now know that there's biological liquid crystals too. And this water inside of us is structured into a liquid crystal. So why, why is that important with, with sensing things, with sensing energy fields? Liquid crystals have been studied and well known to be able to interact with electromagnetic fields. 
And so what, what, what are we, but just pr we produce a ton of electromagnetic fields. The, the, the frequencies of light around us are electromagnetic fields. There's vibrations happening that are, that are electromagnetic fields and frequencies. And, um, you know, the speed with which our heart, our body is pumping blood is its own electromagnetic field. I mean, there's, we're, we're basically just walking balls of electromagnetism and something, and we're in a world that's a big, gigantic globe of electromagnetism something had to be able to sense that. And so we, 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 again, reduce it. Well, I can't see it. I can't smell it. I can't touch it. You know, I can't, I can't uh, hear it. Right. And so it, it must not be important, but now we know that it's the water inside of our bodies that interacts with all of these electromagnetic fields in us and around us and uses that information to, help con con control our physiology, help to adapt. And the mitochondria, because they're, they're the essential directors in the cell, they can really sense and use that information to say, to signal to the DNA, express this protein, turn that one off. Um, you know, okay, okay, the cell is functioning really well, but we need to repair that protein and we need to, we need to fix that. Okay, there's a lot of nitric oxide and a lot of intracellular calcium. I'm sensing a, a stressed out cellular state we got to shut down bioenergetics. We got to, you know, maybe signal apoptosis, autophagy, cell danger response. So there's a lot, right? There's a lot that those mitochondria can do. And it's because of that water network inside of us that's a liquid crystal and can interact with electromagnetic fields. I think that's incredible. And I think that you just unearthed for us some of the places that we encounter electromagnetic fields in a natural environment. And I think that I, th I mean, I think that there's a lot of hubris in science to to consider the things we can't see. And I actually, you know, now we see this Internet of Things. We know that we can communicate so much through electromagnetic fields. And we see this with our Wi-Fi and we see this with our AirPods. And so we have all of these electromagnetic fields that are gifted to us by nature that are in constant communication with our biology. What about these other electromagnetic fields that we've created are those talking uh, absolutely right but the question is and we still don't really have a, a an answer to this we've got a lot of information pointing us in a certain direction but what message are they giving us right yes they've been around for a hundred years maybe right yeah maybe right so, so because they've been, they, these are, these are foreign artificial signals. And so number one, you know, sitting next to a Wi-Fi router or holding a cell phone up to my head or having AirPods in my ears or having an Apple watch on all the time, it's constantly el emitting electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic frequencies. But what it's doing, we don't know, but I can, I can speculate that a foreign signal to the mitochondria that hasn't been around like the sun for millions of years, the sun for billions, right? But, but to the <laughs> mitochondria, I have, I have a feeling the mitochondria is can, at least confused and saying yes. something along the lines of what the heck is this? And yes. if, if, the, if that mitochondrion doesn't know what it is, if anything, if we don't know what something is, we don't necessarily say, uh, it, 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 I'm sure it's safe. It has to be safe, right? I don't know what it is, but you know, let's just assume it's the safest thing on the planet, right? I have a feeling those mitochondria being like, this is kind of weird. We're going to change our bioenergetics. We're going to change our signaling. And we now know actually that from the work of Dr. Martin Paul, right over in, uh, I think Washington State University, um, that in response to non-native, all these artificial electromagnetic frequencies, that that causes a rush of calcium into the cell. And that's actually a cell danger trigger. So you open these voltage-gated calcium channels and calcium floods in. And mitochondria, actually, one of their roles is to sequester calcium. And they, they do it because you want just a fine balance of yes. calcium inside of the cell, right? It's a second messenger. You've learned this, right? It triggers other cascades. And so when there's a rush of it, the mitochondria has to say, oh, crap, we don't want that much. Like, that, that's too much. And if there's a ton of it, like what's happening with the non-native electromagnetic fields and opening these voltage-gated calcium channels, 
all of a sudden that mitochondria is like, oh, we're in trouble, right? And so it definitely starts to signal, uh, it releases more reactive oxygen species, right? It's like, that. that's like, these reactive oxygen species are like this biophotonic symphony that originally kind of looks like a little, maybe it might look like a little ping here and there, but when those ca that calcium floods in, that's a full-blown, you know, 4th of July firework finale, right? It's boom, boom, yes. boom, 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 boom. And these reactive oxygen species, we need some, right? We, yes, we, they're we, important. We, they're important, right? We, we've, we've wrongly assumed that they're horrible all the time and they cause aging and we've tried to suppress them to not a good effect. So we need some of them. But when, they, when we get this firework effect, it ultimately results in the production of the hydroxyl radical, peroxynitrite, all these really damaging ones that can't get quenched. These mitochondria are signaling, you know, danger, danger, danger. When the mitochondria signals danger, the rest of the body senses danger, and so many things change, right? So it could be localized to a tissue. It could be systemic throughout the body. But anytime the mitochondria senses danger and starts to signal it, that's when you start to see a degradation in function, mitochondrial dysfunction, which we now are learning is a really fundamental player in pretty much every diagnosed disease you could name. Absolutely. And I think that there's this aspect, you know, and this is just correlation. It's always important to remember that correlation doesn't equal causation. But as we've seen this increase in non-native electromagnetic fields throughout the last 50 or 60 years, so have we also seen an increase in diseases that are perhaps precipitated from this initial reaction of inflammation or of excess reactive oxygen species within our environment. And so, you know, I think that there's, while there's just a nascent understanding of this, I think it would be hubris to not consider that these electromagnetic fields might be interfering with our, our delicate and fascinating biology. Yeah, absolutely. Because what we do know about electromagnetic waves, right, is that they can either converge or, or or interfere, right? And that's an, that's an important thing that happens. Um, you know, convergence basically doubles can double the size yep. of the wave. Interference can cancel it out. So, what are these non-native frequencies doing? Are, are are some of them mimicking our phys our biology enough to create interference where there shouldn't be? Create too much convergence where there shouldn't be? Um, I forget the researcher who did this, but there's research that we actually, we produce our own microwave frequency or radio frequency radiation inside of us, like endogenously. So then when all, with all these other things, like, you know, I mean, I don't have anything wireless, but all these wireless technologies, if they're also producing this radio frequency radiation, it only makes sense to me that they're gumming up our signal in some way, shape or form. Yes, absolutely. And so what are some of the ways that we might begin to mitigate this if we were mm -hmm. concerned about it in our in our daily lives? Oh, that's a good question, right? I, I think step number one to mitigate, uh, not only to mitigate non-native EMFs, but to support that water battery, to support mitochondrial health, to give mitochondria a sense of calm is to be outside in nature, right? Yes. In sunlight, barefoot, grounded. If you can be at a beach or in the forest or something where you're truly surrounded by nature, that's step one right there. Yes. Because not only do you get like this calming nervous system effect, you get, you, you, the mitochondria also get this calming effect. You produce these, your heart starts to calm. You get heart rate coherence, right? You produce these scalar waves that really calm the whole system down. So that's step one. And in a forest, actually, you have the benefit of being around trees in the ocean or in, in a lake or something, you have the benefit of being in water that kind of acts as its own Faraday cage to, to suppress or to, to, to limit or mitigate the amount of non-native electromagnetic frequencies that are coming closer to, coming close to us. Um, also being grounded, being barefoot in nature provides something called an umbrella effect because the, the power of the earth is so vast. As we're charging ourselves up with electrons from earthing, essentially we're, we're, we're moving electrons into us. Anything that moves creates its own electromagnetic field, right? So as we're moving electrons into our body, we're almost creating our, it's, it's, it's an umbrella, right? We're creating our own barrier to something like the power line that's down the street or the cell phone tower that's a mile away, right? Like we're creating our own little ba barrier. And so barefoot in nature, a beautiful thing, but then what do we do? Like if, if we're, we need to use, well, you and I need technology, right? We need it yes. right now to be able to communicate. And yes. so step one is hardwiring it if at all possible. Right. I yeah, mean, I'm I think hard, people I'm, can see. Yeah. I'm, I'm right? hardwired in, my headphones are hardwired. My computer is hardwired. 
I'm yeah. directly connected to the internet. I'm not yep. using a, a modem or Wi-Fi. Yep, it, that, it, it, that's exactly it. So whenever possible, switch, especially where you spend the majority of your time, make it as hardwired as possible. You can use, you know, you can get like a little meter right too, and you can measure and see where your sources of electromagnetic radiation are. That's a tri-field too. There's other ones as well. Um, but I say like it, the, a simple thing is make your work, workstation hardwired. It looks ugly. My kids complain about it, right? Like all these wires everywhere, mom. It's so uncool. Like, oh, whatever. I don't right. Like, doesn't even matter. <laughs> doesn't right? even matter. Plug it in. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't doesn't. I'm not. I don't hear it. Like, not phased. It's like, okay, you'll you'll thank me when you, you'll thank me later. Um, and so so hard wiring in the workstation is key. Uh, putting the phone on airplane mode, right? Like right now, because I'm not using this, my phone is on airplane mode, and you can me actually too. get an adapter that plugs in and you can uh, you can plug your ethernet cable into the adapter and you can get internet while your phone is in airplane mode. So that's another thing, right? And just those steps alone right there m limits a lot. And then at night, again, everything needs to either be off. Like these days, there's prop houses probably have at least 20 devices, right? A, a family house has at least 20 devices and so many smart technologies. So at least turn them off when you sleep, unplug your internet. Uh, everything goes on airplane mode or just turn it off. That's even better. Um, disable your Alexas, dis disable your smart technology on stuff. You know, um, we just, we just got one of these cards in the mail, you know, from our consumers energy uh, company that, that said, we're congratulations. We're upgrading your, your meter you know and if you don't want it you know we can you can keep your uh what do they call they call it a legacy meter it's a like, legacy you know, like, meter right, you, don't, right. you do not want a smart meter no exactly so i called i called right away i was like i was like yeah i want to keep my legacy meter and it was this whole spiel of well you know ma'am there are no harmful effects and yada 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 it's like yeah you know yes 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 sure just keep my meter right mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but you know sadly i look throughout my neighborhood they've been replaced right and we all oh no actually not just us these lovely neighbors over here, they actually, they actually like this stuff too. Um, there's two of us, right? But two out of a neighborhood full of people that maintain the legacy, everything else is smart meters. And that's just contributing to like this electro pollution, right? This, this electromagnetic mm. soup that you yeah. called earlier, yeah. <laughs> maybe before we were recording. Yeah, we call it um, EMF soup. <laughs> yeah, the EMF soup. And so, so never fear though, right? There's a couple of things to be aware of. Number one, the distance to the exposure matters, which means that this being held here is way more detrimental to being held here, which is way more detrimental to me setting it over here if for some reason I have to talk on a wireless Zoom call, right? The distance matters. It's something called the yes. inverse square property, right? So, mm. so distancing yourself from the source is key as well. And then don't underestimate filling your body up with like positive frequencies, right? Like this is just like a new, a new dive that I'm doing, right? But this idea that we're generating our own fields, especially our heart field, right? That's the most powerful field. And so we can actually use emotions of love and joy and gratitude and peace mm. um, in order to actually just build up our own electromagnetic frequency, almost like a mini Faraday cage, right? Like kind of expanding our our energy out so that we're not we are blocking those those frequencies or we're not necessarily allowing them to come as as much in contact with us again science on that is new and we're piecing stuff together but i really truly think that there's something to that i really think that there is something to that and i think that we are meant as humans to experience states of joy and and to have that change the way that we interact with people both both on a, a macro level and on this electromagnetic level Re yeah yeah no you're absolutely right you know it, it again like I, i'm studying these anomalies and and there's anomalies that show that gene expression changes faster because like with an emotion like gene expression will change before the biochemistry that we think should trigger the change right or mitochondria will change their bioenergetics before some sort of biochemical cascade should have triggered it so there is something to be said about our emotions impacting our physiology in ways that we don't understand but we absolutely. do know that if we do know that positive emotions are associated with health and negative emotions and stress and fear are associated with potentially disease, disease, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I think, I, I don't think we can underestimate, even though we don't fully understand, I don't think we can underestimate that at all.
Gosh, I just, I agree so completely. And I think that one of the things my husband and I talk about is finding joy as an act of rebellion. Uh, that this is yeah. truly just our way of, of being free. And it doesn't mean that we, we experience it all the time. I don't, I don't want to sugarcoat anything, but it is a conscious choice that we work to make that there are times when I am not feeling it. And I, I, I work to step into that state and to make that decision to be there. Absolutely. You know, and it, it just, just knowing just, or, or, or putting it, elevating it, elevating joy or laughter or something just a little bit higher in terms of its importance to our health. It, it changes what I want to do at the end of the day. Like, do I want to watch the news? I mean, I haven't done that in years, but do I like may, maybe if ever, but do like, do I want to watch the news with all the, the, the depressed, the depressing stories and fear mongering, or do I want to, uh, read a book that like, you know, a really good story, or do I want to go for a walk or do I want to play tag with my kids? Or like, even if it's a rainy day, do I want to watch a, do I want to want to watch a funny movie with them? Right? Like, do I, I like, yes. what am I choosing to do? Yes. And I, and I make different choices just because I know that my emotions are actually driving a really important part of my physiology. I'm going to pause right here. My computer came unplugged and it's dying. And so give me two seconds. Sure. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, you're fine. Um, I think that this is so important and it is, it's just choosing and choosing laughter. I, I, my husband and I talk a lot about play. I know that we just did a podcast together and we talk a lot about this aspect of play and laughter and joy. It's so a big part of my life. And I think it's something that we should be incorporating and considering through this lens of health. I want to, I, I, I want to take a, I want side street and i want to dive into circadian biology a little bit oh yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and i was wondering if you might walk us through what a day of light looks like as we move mm. through morning and afternoon and evening and then into darkness yeah yeah you know um i i feel like probably like so many of us that i was never really in touch with the day night cycle right we don't have to be I can make it as bright as I want inside, you know, I can make it as I can, you know, all, at all times of the day, right? Um, I could never experience darkness. Yeah, we and live then in even be perpetual daytime, perpetual summer. And even in perpetual summer inside of the house, it's still, if we're measuring the brightness of the light, it's still way dimmer than being outside, right? Even outside on a cloudy day. So it's like, be, we're, we're like really just messing up these light signals in our environment because we can, right? And, and we don't necessarily understand that there's a reason why we should be aware of it. And so let's, if you think about, if you think about humans of the past, there was always, there, there was the only thing that they really had access to was the light of the sun, potentially candlelight, firelight, something like that, right? Yes. Um, but, but what they had to do is they had to live in tune with the sun rising, the sun setting, and then a period of darkness, right? Sunrise, sunset, period of darkness over and over and over again. And then fast forward to, I don't know, late 1800s, right? Edison invents the light bulb, Tesla, he does, he did many, many things that were great, um, <laughs> probably suppressed, but, uh, but he had the power grid, right? Like, so we were able to all of a sudden distribute electricity and, and artificial lighting. And it was viewed, it was one of those world's fairs, maybe like the St. Louis or something. It was viewed as like mm -hmm. this, ah, like we, we, we came to, we, we've entered a new era. Yes. Um, and, and I think it is contributing to our disconnect with nature just I in the same too. way that these non-native electromagnetic frequencies are. And so, you know, the research is now booming, right? Because it's like, you have to almost, almost you have to like get so far away from it and recognize like, wait a second, are, is, is that bad? Like that we're not in connection with nature anymore. And so a lot of research is now done on circadian rhythm, which basically is talking about how the body, we now know it, we've mapped that the body has key things things and key operations that it does based on a 24 hour clock, you know, makes sense, right? If I've got a hundred thousand tasks happening every cell, every second, I, I, I should optimize those tasks to the time of day, right? Yes. So, and we, we evolved with light uh, that was present in our evolution. And so it's going to make sense that that is going to be part of the force that shaped us. 
us and every other living thing like ev yes. literally ev from bacteria to fungi to plants everything exhibits is, exhibits circadian rhythm and it, it it's easy it's easier almost to explain this with plants than humans to start off with because it requires energy for a plant to open its petals to open its leaves and and to, to bend its movement towards the sunlight to capture energy like that requires a lot of work and so then when the sun's not present or when it's its power is starting to weaken or is not strong enough it it starts to close its petals it closes its leaves right it conserves takes a break. it conserves its energy because it makes no sense to continue to put out energy in the period of darkness when it can't utilize the sun's energy we're the same way right not, and not necessarily just because of us pulling in the sun's energy but because we have a lot of work going on in the body we optimize different functions based on where the sun is in the sky like middle of the afternoon is actually we actually ha are optimized for some things morning we, we really focus on other things evening other things and then oh yeah that whole period of darkness known as sleep or we should be sleeping right in darkness we do a whole other host of tasks during that phase and when we're t in tune with the day night cycle when my eyes are exposed to natural light, naked eyes, right? Not wearing these glasses, but when my naked eyes are outside and I'm exposed to the natural light, my brain can tell me what time of day it is. And it can it conveys that message to every cell in my body, which then changes clock gene signaling and other signaling to optimize function based on the time of day, right? It's the coolest thing ever. And so yes, things shift based on the time of day, but we have to know what time of day it is. And the problem with living indoors is if we're under, let, let's picture a typical office space, you know, fluorescent lights that never change, crazy blue lit screen that never changes, right? So we're in this perpetual time like it, that never happens nothing it's like these weird light frequencies not number one they never mimic the sun right they're these no. weird blends of light and they never change so it's a really confusing thing for the brain because it's like what are, are we stuck like in time like what's going on you know is it just noon and, forever right is it noon forever right should we just make sure it's like be noon that's exactly what's happening right and so the right now you and i have been talking for about an hour or so and i can't consciously perceive a huge change in the light right i know things have shifted maybe a little bit um but if i you know being if i were outside my eyes would literally be able to tell my brain the time of day to the second right to the second yes. of the day so um so that's what's important because we have to be able to optimize all of our functions and sync them up to the light and then when the light's not there like in the absence of light we have a whole bunch of programs that we run while we sleep again to kind of set us up for success at the start of the next day and we're living in this per period of just circadian dis dysfunction this this n lack of connection to the to the fluctuations of sunlight and it doesn't matter if it's sunny cloudy rainy foggy snowy being outside we get the light signals no matter what the changing light signals no matter what um and our body needs that and so now you're seeing like Again, all this research, circadian rhythm dysfunction is associated with obesity, diabetes, anxiety, depression, breast cancer, prostate cancer, blah, blah, blah. you know, you, you go on and on and on. Um, and it makes sense. Why? Right? Because when the when the when the cells can't tell or when, when we don't know what time of day it is again this goes back to like those non-native electromagnetic frequencies when we when when the mitochondria and the cells sense something's off, it doesn't assume all is good. Let's thrive it goes more into like that danger mode, right? And that yes. means, again, more reactive oxygen species, the wrong, so more inflammation, the wrong signaling to the DNA, et cetera, et cetera, driving that chaos, driving that mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular dysfunction and disease. I think that this is so important. I know that one of the things that led my husband out here to farm was this opportunity to work outside and to get to work in close co-creation with nature and to have this better chance to connect to nature, which I think is the master regulator of our own biology. And this really started for me many years ago with seeking out waking up around sunrise and getting outside, not through a window, but getting outside to view the sunrise and to have that light hit my eyes and inform my brain and 
all of my biology, where I was and what time of day it was. And so what starts us off in the morning? So can we get up and, and yeah. how do we start this cycle of connecting to our circadian rhythm? Uh, morning is key, I find. And I feel like that provides the most profound changes for people in the shortest amount of time because the, the morning sunlight actually does so many things for our brain and our body. Um, so step one, I always tell people when you wake up, you, you can't just flip on all the lights. I mean, if you wake up before, I mean, even if you wake up after sunrise, like if you just don't shove a bunch of artificial lights, artificial screen light into your face, into your eyes. So I actually, and I don't have them down here, but I actually have like, these are yellow tone, but I have orange tone ones, right? That I wear that really block all mm -hmm. of that blue light, you know, um, cause it's the blue light frequency. We hear about these blue light screens. It's the blue light frequency that really is the most, the most damaging to our circadian rhythm when it comes from an artificial source. In so, screens know, and light bulbs. Screens and bulbs. Light, yep. Yeah. The big source of, of blue light big, that you don't exactly, want. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so I have these orange glasses on, right? You know, I'm going through the house. Um, and then at sunrise, you know, sometimes a little before, sometimes a little after, right? I go outside and I spend as much time at sunrise as possible with naked eyes. So these go up on my head. I step my bare feet to the earth. I'll say gratitude, prayer, something like that, you know, and, and I'll just be one with nature. And a lot of things happen. Um, with, within seconds, my eyes are sucking in the photons of light. So like, you know, these little particles of light get sucked into my eyes and it, the backs of my eyes have little catchers in it, so little receptors for these photons. And based on the blend of colors, these receptors are catching, um, it conveys the time of day to my brain. And so in the middle of my brain, I have the suprachiasmatic nucleus, this time clock in my brain that then conveys that to the rest of my cells. In the meantime, while I'm out there, I'm bathing myself in this infrared light frequency, right? That's charging up this exclusion zone water battery inside yep. of me. Penetrating I'm up to 30 centimeters deep. Mm -hmm. Penetrating all throughout me. I have my feet barefoot on the earth. So I'm sucking electrons in that way. Um, earthing also within seconds, earthing calms the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. So there's a ton of people that are working on vagus nerve stimulation and stuff, which I, I think we we're in a stressed out state all the time. But I think a huge component to that is just our lack of connection with nature because we can really calm our nervous system. So it's like I'm giving my body and my nervous system a sense of, of where I am in space, where I am on this earth, a sense of safety. Um, and then the sunlight layers itself, right? Like it doesn't shoot all the frequencies at us at once. There's no ultraviolet light at sunrise, you know? And so we start to get different blends of frequencies. And as these catcher's mitts in my eyes start to capture these, you know, it actually causes different chemical changes in my brain. So uh, when blue light becomes most dominant, right, shortly after sunrise, when you get this blend of blue and red, it starts to wake up hormone centers in my brain. So my hypothalamus, right, my pituitary, I start to make these hormones. My mitochondria actually sense that signal and start to make pregnenolone, which is one of my main steroid hormones, right, that then can be, it can be more cortisol, it could be my sex steroid hormone. So it's like in the morning I can take this snapshot and, you know, my mitochondria are like, is Carrie stressed out? And do we need to like funnel pregnenolone to cortisol or is Carrie calm, copacetic, well-fed, got enough body fat to, you know, can she make a baby? Right. And so then it goes in that direction. I love that. Um, and I love it. It's almost like the stem cell of, of hormones, this master hormone. And, and there it is. It can go wherever you need it. And these decisions are being made on a second to second basis based exactly. on the input from your environment. Exactly. And so if I'm in a natural environment, getting the full blend of light, all of the good electromagnetic frequencies, my brain and body is, and my mitochondria are more likely to say, oh, Carrie's calm, Carrie's chill. It's all good. We'll optimize her cortisol. But then, you know, if she wants to make a baby, right, there you go. We'll, 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 we'll make sure that there's, there's that there, there and available as well. Um, as opposed to when we flip on artificial lights, it's big in the blue, but it contains almost no red, right? Red and infrared used to be in incandescent bulbs, but they're considered energy inefficient, you know? And so we got rid of them, right? We got rid of them because they're energy inefficient. Um, but in the meantime, without the red balancing out the blue, we're not getting the right signal to the hypothalamus. We're getting a strong stress signal, right? And so good luck telling your mitochondria all is copacetic with that kind of light. 
And so then shortly after that, blue light starts to dominate and we get this beautiful hormonal cascade happening throughout the body. Now, these are these hormones are, are happening, right? They're happening all the time. But like you, you, there, this is where the circadian rhythm comes in, right? You know, like it would make no sense for me to turn on hormone centers at two o'clock in the morning, right? You know, it, may, it might not be the ideal time to get things revved up and rolling. And so then after that blue light, we ultimately get ultraviolet A. That's another frequency that comes. So blue, indigo, violet, ultraviolet. Um, ultraviolet A is a frequency that goes into my eyes, and they're, they're these little, they're these little uh, building blocks of proteins that are really concentrated in the backs of my eyes called aromatic amino acids. Um, and they, they have a ring-shaped structure, which we now know actually is waiting to catch a photon. It's waiting to trap a photon because it needs a little bit of energy to become something else. And so you have uh, a, few of, a few different types. Uh, two of them, phenylalanine and tyrosine back there, are capturing ultraviolet A photons to give them energy to become dopamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline, thyroid hormone, right? Like there's so much, there's this whole cascade that happens when that, those particular amino acids capture ultraviolet A. And then you have tryptophan, another amino, aromatic amino acid that captures ultraviolet A. It becomes serotonin. So we build up this serotonin store in the morning. And then in the evening, when we sense darkness, that serotonin can get converted to melatonin, right? And so like we're setting up a good night's sleep with morning sunlight. But in the meantime, we're feeling freaking amazing because my dopamine is, is good. I got good noradrenaline, nor, norepinephrine. My thyroid is, is up and rolling. Um, my serotonin levels are, are, are awesome. And this then is nature's cup of coffee. Nature's cup of coffee. Exactly. Like it's, it, um, it, people are amazed at how much energy and just focus they feel when they capture these wavelengths of light. It's like a game changer. And it doesn't take a long time, right? In an ideal world, we'd be, we'd be outside for the first three hours of the morning all the time, right? And, and never have to work or take care of kids or whatever. Um, but you can actually do it in, in five minutes here, five minutes there. Yes. Like little chunks of time matter. And then lastly, if people who are inflamed or people who are in pain, another chemical in the brain called POMC takes that ultraviolet A light and breaks itself into different downstream chemicals to uh, make beta endorphin, right? Endorphin runners high to make, uh, to make things that stimulate fat utilization, libido, right? So, okay, you know, Carrie's got calm and copacetic. We're going to funnel pregnenolone into progesterone and estrogen, that balance. We're going to up her libido and she's going to she, go for it, you know, make that baby, you know? Um, but also <laughs> anti-inflammatory chemicals like ACTH, which is like a, a corticosteroid, right? We get steroid injections to lower inflammation. Um, beta endorphin also helps to suppress pain. So when I hear people who are like I was, right? Inflamed, tired, puffy, lethargic, lack of focus, brain fog, you know, just all of that stuff. It's like, wow, like one simple shift to really prioritize morning sunlight into the eyes can be so profound in so many ways. I really think that this is, this is so vital. And I think that the, the lack of re regulation that we have within our circadian biology really speaks to this disconnection that we experience with nature. But it is something that we can recover in little light breaks throughout the day, little, little bits and chunks as we begin to sort of rewire that connection. And something that you really talk about that I love is this idea of light as a nutrient. Mm -hmm. Here is this other way that we are gaining both energy and this communication that's happening with our environment that is governing our biology. Absolutely. You know, no one would deny that there's, that people can get vitamin C deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, right? That we, we've got technical terms for these things, right? We know that you can get a nutrient deficiency, a vitamin deficiency, but we don't have any words for when we're not getting the red light or the infrared light or the ultraviolet light. Like we don't have words for that, but that's exactly what it is. Modern living, modern glass block. It just so happens to block like all of those key frequencies. It blocks a lot of the infrared. It blocks a lot of the red. It blocks all the ultraviolet, right? And so living indoors behind glass, we're totally deficient in key nutrients from the light, key frequencies of light that we now know go into our bodies and interact with our eyes and our skin and our mitochondria in so many ways that we need. It's an absolute requirement. So uh, I look at, I do, it's a light deficiency that we're in right now. We've got circadian deficiency, light deficiency, electron deficiency, and it's just from modern living indoors. 
But when we're looking at the quantum scale, right, when we're looking at things that are influencing things at the proton, photon, electron level, it works non-linearly. You know, you, you talked originally about like this linear mindset with, you know, Descartes, Newton, this linear mindset, yeah. right? The coolest part about quantum influence is that it works non-linearly. So small inputs of the right kind can actually have this beautiful cascading effect. So it's not like when I'm tell when I tell myself like I got I want to get stronger at push-ups and I'm just going to do three push-ups every day the rest of my life and I'm going to get way stronger at push-ups. It's like no, that's a that, that's a linear process. To get stronger at push-ups, I'll do three today, I'll do four tomorrow, I'll do five the next day, you know, and I'll build up strength in a linear fashion. But with the non-linear uh, fashion, three minutes of getting morning sunlight at key key windows of time. First thing at sunrise, or when there's UVA light appearing, when there's UVB light there, you know, that makes vitamin D in our skin. If we can make those three minutes count in terms of when we time them, that's nine minutes. And it's super profound compared to just doing three push-ups, you know, for the rest of my life. It's a very, very cool thing to understand the nonlinear effect at the quantum scale. I love that. And I, I think that that brings it back to this piece of when we begin to step into this nonlinear thinking modality that we can really begin to see science, to see biology, to see our connectedness, to see our unity through a very, very different lens. And that actually leads me into how I wanted to to kind of begin to wrap this up with, which is talking about our disconnection from nature. I think so many of the things that we've talked about, whether it's building exclusion zone water and interacting with electromagnetic frequencies, interacting with light, all of these things speak to this, this disease, this dis-ease that we're feeling as, as a collective really coming from this disconnection from nature. And we talk a lot about this on this podcast that we've, we've just broken. And not only that, but we don't view ourselves as part of nature, that we are a really important force within this interconnected web. And so I just wanted to see how all of this speaks to that disconnection for you. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, it speaks so profoundly, right? Because Everything about indoor living, it, 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 it's a barrier. Indoor living really, truly creates a physical barrier from all of those things you talked about. Um, but when, and it's, you know, it's, it's not always easy, right? Like it's easy to get sucked onto a phone screen and just scroll, 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 right? But when you start to recognize how profound it is to be outside, then small, like making those little shifts, like, you know, I, I literally had clients who I, I, I'm not, I'm obviously not going to name names, but I think we're so phone addicted. I said, step one, use your phone outside, barefoot under the sun, right? You know, with, with, with a red, like slightly red filter on your phone, yes. right? Like let's it's like, 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 and that one step alone was enough to be like, they felt better. They realized they didn't have to take their phone outside anymore. They actually wanted to go outside and, and never, never thought about, you know, need, needing their phone, needing social media, needing, needing a distraction. And so I think as we start to implement more experiences outside, it, it doesn't even, it doesn't even have to be nature. Like I think sometimes there's a barrier when we hear nature, it's like, oh, I got to drive to that forest yes. where I could hike a mountain, you know, yes. I got to drive to the beach where I can touch the sand. It's like, no, where where do you have a tree that you can sit next yes. to? Where is there a little piece of patch of grass that you could stand barefoot on? Yeah, you you got gravel, right? I get people who say, well, what about pebbles? What about sit on the rocks, right? Rocks yes. are nature, you know. And so you you start to do it conveniently for you in your in your neighborhood, in your city, wherever it might be, and you start to recognize something is different about me. I feel different when I'm out there. I want to do it more. It's something I look forward to. And that's where you're starting to recognize, wow, like I'm finally returning my body to where it feels most at peace, to where it feels most energized, where my brain feels the clearest. Um, and then just if you start to get into this quantum aspect, you start to learn through the quantum lens and quantum language, all the cool things that are happening. But you don't even have to understand any of that to in, in, inherently feel better when you are just outside, sitting on a bench, 
at a park, you know, touching a tree or putting your hands on, playing with the grass, playing with the dandelion, something like that. It just feels good. And so I really love to be able to use this quantum language to encourage people just to take a little more time outside and just start to feel how your body is different when you are outside and build from there. We are hardwired for this connection. I mean, all of our evolution has been leading to this, the deep interconnectedness of our lives with nature. And so you don't need anything. It's, it's free. It doesn't cost a single thing to step out there and to experience this. You don't have to understand it to feel it. And I, I love that you said that. And it doesn't have to be an event. Nature doesn't have to be with a capital N that exists somewhere outside that you have to get to or vacation to. Even just experiencing the sun on your skin in the middle of a city is part of that full interaction. 100%, right? Opening a window. That's nature right? You're allowing the outside in. And then next step, taking your, in, your body from the inside out. But you're exactly right, right? That all of that stuff provides such a profound experience for the body. We can't underestimate it. You know, we've disconnected ourselves enough to, I think, to realize that it doesn't feel right. And we need to start reestablishing that connection. I think there's a void. There's a void there that we're all looking to fill. And I think that we give a lot of names to that void. We give a lot of pathologies to that void in, in modern society. And I think that what it really is, is just that disconnection. And I think it's amazing all of the pathologies that we can begin to heal when we step back into it. You know, you're absolutely right. And it, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting that both sunlight builds dopamine and serotonin and, you know, these kind of feel good neurochemicals that we hear all about. But unfortunately, the same, the wavelengths of blue light from the screen are, that's the same thing, right? Like we become addicted to these screen technologies. Mm. So it's really easy to, to, it's really easy to think we feel good inside. Really, if we think we feel good when we hear that ding or we you know someone likes our stuff or you're know, like, we think we feel good with that. Um, but it's an empty, it's an empty feel good. Like it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's this overburning of these dopamine tracks, right? So to, to this extent where we're always needing the next like, the next notification, the next whatever it is to feel better and better. And that's not how it works in nature. You get that same or even a greater, more profound dopamine hit, a more profound serotonin hit. Everything is balanced and it's so fulfilling in such a deep way because of how like how we resonate with nature's frequencies. So you're exactly right. There's a void and it's easy to get sucked in to think we're, we're doing something that makes us feel good when we're using this technology and we're inside. But you can get so much more in terms of those same dopamine reward pathways when we're just, you know, under sunlight, naked eyes, connecting our bare feet to the earth. Yes. I think there's there's a beautiful book called The Molecule of More. Have you read this? Oh, about no, no about dopamine and and some of how it plays in our daily life and our evolutionary biology and and what a powerful molecule not just of of feeling good but also of motivation mm -hmm. we talk a lot about this lack of focus and this lack of motivation and i think one of the big things that's missing within that context is dopamine and and it's such an incredible molecule of evolution. I know we've talked about this on the podcast, but it was really built when we would find suddenly a bush full of red berries, full of sugar. And our genetics want to encode that memory that during this time of the season, here is this source of abundance and this source of energy. Makes perfect sense. It absolutely yeah. makes perfect sense. And now we're just experiencing it at a quietly, a quite different scale. These quite days. different scale. It actually reminds me, one thing I wanted to touch on before we begin to wrap up is I wanted to touch on a circannual rhythm. As we mm. talk about light and as we talk about all of these interactions with nature, what does this look like when you're at maybe a more northern latitude? Like I know you are and I'm mm -hmm. I'm in upstate New York, so I'm I'm very far north. And yeah. so what does this look like circannually? Yeah, you know, we don't we don't talk about that a ton, but it's and and it has really only been within the past five years that I've been seeing every sunrise and you know going outside more that I recognize that oh, this is when the sun the days really start to lengthen, or oh, this is when the days really start to shorten. Oh, and now the sun is here in the sky, whereas the last time it was there. You know, what I mean, so it's like you start to recognize that yeah. all of those are signals that the body uses. But for those of us, especially at northern latitudes, there was 
always preparation at some point for a period of cold and dark and scarce. Um, that again, it's like it's winter, and I I say that we're continuously in metabolic summer because yes. it's bright. It's it can be seventy degrees and sunny inside, not really sunny, right? But seventy degrees and bright, and we have food aplenty. And there is a need for metabolic winter, just as there is a need for metabolic summer, right? The body prioritizes different things. Summer is about finding and building and gathering, not just finding and building and gathering in terms of shelter and finding food and stuff, but it's like we're building our strength back up where, uh, you know, we're putting on some, uh, like some storage for, for, for mm-hmm. the potential for food scarcity. And this especially builds up when the, the sunlight starts to wane more towards the fall, right in the fall. And so we have this difference in like, we hear, we hear these days, it, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine now that I kind of understand this differently, that everyone has the vitamin D deficiency in winter. It's like, well, yeah, I, I think they're supposed to. And I think we're only testing one marker. So is it really a deficiency or is it a shift in metabolic processes? Are we going from vitamin D high metabolic winter to or metabolic summer to metabolic winter when maybe melatonin should be more elevated? Getting into this idea that we are not a linear being that is just supposed to be even keel throughout the year and that there are going to be peaks and troughs that might serve a biological purpose. And they did, right? Because we know that there's this key time in the fall when we've built up enough vitamin D, when we're sensing this, the days are getting shorter, when fructose is more available, we're stumbling upon more of those big, big, bright bushes full of berries, that we start to generate uric acid. We start to become slightly insulin resistant, like in a good way, right? Because we need to just store a little bit extra for the potential for scarcity in the winter. And then in the winter... There should be cold and scarcity and darkness. You, people who tell me they feel more tired in the winter, I'm like, you're supposed to feel more tired in the winter, right? That's like, how it works. That's how it works. You're supposed to be. So it's like this idea that I have to be a go, go, go on, energized all year round. That's not what nature gives us. Nature gives us a period where we're more energized. We want to go outside and do and be and be active. Like 70 and sunny right now. Are you kidding me? This is like beautiful, right? You can't catch me inside except for stuff like this. Yeah, me neither. (laughs) And so, and, but, but in the middle of winter, you know, maybe negative five and dark and cold, maybe I'm going to, you know, put a fire in the fireplace and hunker down and just rest. And maybe I'm going to go to bed at seven 30 and that's okay. Because again, the, 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 the circannual, the circannual rhythm, it's like vitamin D and melatonin. I also find that these things, it's interesting when you look at the research, they do similar things like a vitamin D deficiency is associated with autoimmunity. A melatonin deficiency is associated with autoimmunity. A vitamin D deficiency is associated with cancer. A melatonin deficiency is associated with cancer. It's like, so we, our body was given different molecules to kind of help regulate us at different times of year. The issue becomes we're not getting outside in the summer. So we're not maximizing vitamin D in the summer. And we have artificial light on all winter which suppresses melatonin. So we're not maximizing melatonin in the winter. So we're existing in this perpetual state of deficiency, Um, whether it's a true deficiency or not. It's just a perpetual state of not being optimized to what the seasons are giving us. Yes. And I think that another big piece for me having moved here, and it is, it is very cold in the winter. It is very dark in the winter. And we embrace those aspects. We spend our mornings dark, maybe lighting a fire in the fireplace, but not turning on lights immediately. We wait for the sunrise to come. And once it comes, we get outside. I don't use the cold as, as a reason not to be outside interacting with nature and interacting with what sun I do get to experience during that time. And I found that when I'm living in that rhythm, winter feels so much better. It, it takes it takes out some of the sting. And, and, and that slowness is an opportunity to nourish other, other aspects of myself, other aspects of our business, of our creative passions. It's, it's harnessing the opposite of go, go, go and leaning into that slow and juicy. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's exactly it. And, you know, I'm so glad you said it's not an excuse to not get outside. I think, you know, there's a lot of people in this quantum health sphere that um, they they think that you have to live in a tropical location, right? To thrive as a human, right? Yes. And I think that's true if you're not willing to embrace winter 
and embrace darkness. But I think, like you said, if if I'm willing to recognize that my body is supposed to feel a little colder and I'm supposed to still go outside and I'm supposed to still take a little hike, you know, around the block and I'm supposed to, you know, I'm supposed to be one with the cold. Um, if you can embrace the cold in the dark uh, in the way that the seasons, the seasons give us, I think that humans are optimized to live anywhere on the planet as long as I you do can too. embrace the location that you're in and, and, and have the appropriate circadian connection and rhythm with that location. And we know that cold has a whole different cascade of regulatory functions within our biology, that it is enacting its own conversation with our cells. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, so in the winter, it's, in my opinion, the winter is the period of massive repair, right? It's like, we, what, what do we hear these days? Oh, in order to get into autophagy and repair and heal, you got to fast. Well, what naturally happens in the winter? Food scarcity. Uh, you got to sleep. Well, what naturally happens in the winter? More melatonin, more darkness, right? The potential for more sleep. Um, you, uh, you're not going to necessarily want to uh, try to build a ton of muscle and exercise a ton, right? Like, you know, like that's a build. Like, okay, so I'm going to call, be calm. I'm going to chill. I'm going to, I'm going to take advantage of that metabolic winter and actually, just like a hibernating animal would, they wake up in the springtime ready to roll. Everything's been repaired. They've reversed their insulin resistance. They've, you know, got, gotten back to what they would consider probably the weight that they need to be at to, to build a shelter, to find food again. You know, I mean, we can do the same thing. We can take advantage of it, but it, it, we, it, we just don't, right? There's a disconnect. I think it's through this lens of quantum biology and circadian health that we could really start to recognize, oh, I see where I'm at and I see where I've kind of gone astray. And now I really want to start to connect back to what I know my body needs. Yes. And thank you for saying that we can live at more Northern latitudes and make the most of it. Gosh, do I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, yeah, I think we can, right? I think we can. I, uh, I just got to embrace it. Just got yeah, to embrace just it. Just got to embrace it. I want to talk some about your amazing offerings. I know that you, I think everybody who's listened has gotten a, a taste of what an educator you are, what a powerhouse you yourself are, and how much information you're bringing to the table. And so you have some wonderful ways that people can connect deeper with you as an educator and as a coach. I'd love for you to talk about your workshops and courses. Oh yeah. Thank you. You know, I, I do love to teach this and I, and I like to kind of walk the line. I don't want to dumb these topics down, but I want them to be accessible, right? Like it's like, I, I love I, that. I, I, I love that you I, don't want to dumb them down. I, and I think that the, uh, yes, I want to champion this. This has been something that's been hard in, in my work in regenerative agriculture is I want to speak at this level. And I really believe that we have the capacity to, to, find a space within it, even if it takes a little bit of finagling. Exactly. And I think those people who do start to kind of work through this information, they start to appreciate it and apply it and really recognize the importance, right? I, I, I don't, I will, like, I'm not your person if you just want a protocol, right? Like, that's not me. But what I do love to offer are these online, like little online educational courses and webinars and stuff. So, um, one of the best ways to see all of this stuff is through my Instagram account, right? Carrie B Wellness. I post pretty much every day. I have links in my bio to all these courses. Um, I have a series of three courses, right? I've launched the first, but who knows by this by the, when this is this is published? If the other two are coming soon, um, and these are three courses that really tie into exactly what we were talking about. One is called Connect to the Light, so reestablishing that natural connection, and then being aware of how we can mit mitigate our internal environment. Um, another one is called Gather Electrons. So like if electrons are the energy currency of the body, what ways beyond food do we do that? Right. There's even more like ways that we can actually gather up this energy source for our bodies. And the final one is called heal your fields. So am I bathing in electromagnetic soup, <laughs> a radiation, right? Is radiation all around me? Am I, are, are my emotions, what are my emotions and how are they influencing my electromagnetic fields and my connection to nature? Am I in one in touch with the Schumann resonance? Like there's so many ways that we can look at at fields of information and, and vibration and energy um, through this quantum biology lens. So uh, those those courses are available either as a standalone. You can purchase all of them. Uh, it's really how I'm guiding clients these days is through that online platform because uh, we interact in a Facebook group. We have weekly Zoom Q&As. I think it's in this group setting that we can provide support and encouragement and accountability. 
Um, I like this idea of interacting with people on a weekly basis, right? You know, to provide that coaching. Um, and yeah, and then there always comes that, oh yeah, but you know, I'm still experiencing this. And then we can start to shift more into what I would do with one-on-one -on -one coaching. But there are so many foundational things here that I think we need to layer on first. Symptoms change. They go away. The body shifts and changes. It really starts to bring us to, is there still a pathology that we need to address you know, or, 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 and if so, we're that much closer to what that potentially is when we get all of these other things in place. So I really encourage people to interact with me uh, on Instagram, check out these courses. I have some webinars too. If you just kind of want to get snippets of this stuff, um, I, I think that's a great way to go. But really it's this concept of educating and really being able to apply this consistently on a regular basis. I like to help people with that so that they can experience what this feels like for their own bodies. I think that there, I love that. And I love that you're creating community around that because I think that that, that even that changes the way that our biology works. We're meant to be in community. And so to tap into that is amazing. And I know that, I know that just even tomorrow you're hosting, and I, I know a lot of my listeners will appreciate this quantum strategies for anxiety and depression. I'm so sorry. That was definitely my internet. <laughs> Um, I mean, it, I, we got through the whole thing pretty well. I mean, I feel like we, <laughs> it's nice that it was just, yeah, the it, end, the, so. and this is, this is really typical that it usually, it usually craps out at the end, but I want to, I want to make sure that we really capture your courses because that was really important. And I don't know, I didn't hear your answer, um, around your quantum healing strategies for anxiety and depression. Oh, to, did, I didn't hear you. Did you ask about that as a, a webinar? Yeah. Webinar so and I wanted to tell people that that's a webinar that mm -hmm. you're putting on tomorrow. I know that that's something that will connect with a lot of my listeners. Mm -hmm. And so just yet another thing that people can find f from in your education realm. So, yeah. So that webinar on uh, quantum health strategies for anxiety and depression really uh, talks about the circadian and mitochondrial connection to anxiety and depression. Um, so much research is pointing towards circadian rhythm dysfunction and mitochondrial dysfunction as actually being precursors to either depression or anxiety or exacerbating them. Um, and so this webinar is a great way to kind of shift the mindset. Like we, we look at anxiety and depression from a chemical perspective, like must elevate serotonin, you know, must, el must change dopamine. Like we, we look at it from a neurotransmitter balance. And this is actually looking at it from using quantum health lifestyle strategies and using Using that as opposed to, oh, this chemical will influence it. It's like, no, what about, what am I doing with my lighting? What am I doing with my darkness? What am I doing with my breathing? What am I doing with my earthing and grounding and all of these things that can have an influence on both circadian rhythm and mitochondria? I love it. And we'll link to all of this in our show notes. I have one last question that I ask every guest, and that is, what does it mean for you to lay the groundwork? To lay the groundwork. Oh, that's a lovely question. Um, I feel like laying the groundwork in this realm, which is such a new field, this quantum biology, for me, it's both a passion. Like I, I, I have gratitude because I get to kind of read a whole bunch of nerdy stuff that I love and put out there information that I think is useful for people. And, I, and, and I'm really hoping that this quantum health stuff, I guess is what I'll lump it all into, ultimately becomes like this healing modality that everyone, like it's a common term, right? It becomes like, oh yeah, that's quantum or yeah, oh yeah, it's my circadian rhythm. You know, I just feel like, I feel like the groundwork right now is getting the message out there that this even exists. And then continuing to add to this body of research and this body of clinical evidence and these clinical results that show that every time we do go outside and we do connect with nature, this is all the influences that it has in our bodies, you know, and just to continue to reinforce that. So step one, let people know that this is a thing. And then step two, just continue to contribute to that body of work, because I think this is where medicine and healing and health needs to go. I agree completely. And I am just, I am so grateful for the wisdom and the knowledge that you are constantly sharing on your Instagram, that you took the time to share with all of us today, that you share in all of your courses. You are such an incredible teacher and I, it just shines through. I mean, you shine through, you are just a radiant light Likewise. in this space. Thank you. And so I am just so grateful for your time 
tell us where we can find you and we'll link to all of it in the show notes, but on Instagram and beyond. Sure. So Instagram is Carrie B. Wellness, right? So find my Instagram account. It has pretty much everything. I always post everything you need to know there. You can also go to my website, CarrieBWellness.com and uh, sign up for my newsletter, right? So that way you can be posted when new classes come about uh, and things like that. Um, you know, I, I try to check my email, CarrieBWellness at gmail.com as well. So you can always email me too. I think that's fantastic. And again, just, just thank you for being here. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Kate. This was so awesome.